Hey, Les, as, as you had the conversation with Sean about whether he would be back with the team this next season or not, um, can you kind of just take us through what your conversation with him was and whether you expect that to be a conversation you guys have every offseason? Uh, yeah, I've often joked with Sean, uh, probably going back to when maybe he was rumored or it was rumored that ESPN might want him to do uh, Monday Night Football that probably every year he's going to have to answer that question, right, if if he's in a position where uh, networks w- would want Sean to kind of be, you know, one of their number ones. But that was jokingly, you know, before uh, before even uh, the 2021 season. But And I would say this, the, it's more than a conversation. These conversations have gone on, uh, even uh, started before last season uh, for one reason is, Sean, I, I've often said that Sean is when he got the job at age 30, the guy's been basically running an 800 meter sprint every week since he got our job, adding the head coaching title and probably had been running an 800 meter sprint as an offensive coordinator for the two previous seasons in Washington. And, and <laughs> over time, like at some point, you know, a hamstring is going to get tight, a hamstring is going to get pulled and you're not going to be able to do it. So uh, in just ways to probably, uh, I don't know how to term it, whether it's to, you know, delegate more, but somehow uh, basically take his weekly rhythm and make it more sustainable. So I think those conversations will always be had, especially uh, part of our responsibility, uh, myself, Kevin's, you know, being a little bit wiser, maybe because of our age, uh, it, when we did hire a 31 year old, a 30 year old young man to, to help him navigate those waters. Um, but Jack to have him back, uh, uh, definitely Jack that he's going to continue coaching the Los Angeles Rams. Um, as you look at your offense, what you guys did last year compared to the season before when you won a Super Bowl, what needs to happen either externally or internally to get back to that level of success? It, it's a uh, Good question. I, th- I think we could look back at the past. We've been very successful in offense uh, since Sean has taken over. And what's interesting, we've been successful many different ways with with more than one, uh, let's call it starting caliber, franchise caliber QB with, with different wide receivers, different running backs, even different offensive line combinations. And, and during that time, cumulative, a lot of, you know, a top five offense, in a lot of different categories. Uh, So I think it's probably Sean would tell you continue evolving to continue staying ahead of the curve because the uh, NFL coaches will definitely study uh, the past to see if they can, uh, you know, uh, learn some things to stop maybe the future. So uh, defenses, offenses are always uh, playing some sort of chess poker to stay ahead of each other and then it's really it's also looking at what type of personnel you have uh and how you might attack opposing defenses and and we, we like to say it from a macro level uh you know how is our offensive machine going to uh get yards get first down score points and then uh you know at that point it's how do we want to accomplish that what do we want to do to accomplish that who do we need on our team to accomplish that And then just one more for me. Have you um, talked to Matthew Stafford or Aaron Donald and gotten confirmation, I guess, that they'll be on this team next year? You know, we haven't uh, sat down really. I mean, obviously during checkouts and things, you, you, you say goodbye, but that's not the time to to discuss those conversations. But I know we're, we're beginning the process of, of, you know, kind of it's, it's that time of year to, to, to put some blueprints on paper figure out what's next. And, and uh, those type of conversations will definitely be coming uh, with Sean, usually with the way we do it, we like to operate it is Sean, Sean and the individual player. And then at that point in time, if, if uh, the individual player needs to sit down with myself, Kevin, uh, Sean and things like that. So those will be coming here uh, over the next few weeks, months. Thank you. I guess you can follow Aaron Donald on Twitter, maybe. <laughs> My kids did tell me he retired. Saturday for a little bit. Gilbert. Hey, uh, Les, going back to uh, Sean McVay, just watching him operate this challenging season, what did you see from him? And did he feel like a guy who might need a, a break or was he pretty lively? Uh, the, I, 
I, you know what? That's a good, I think probably all, all things you, all of those motions, I do think at the end of the day, uh, uh, the season was tough. The results were tough on Sean, but I, I do know this and, and what's what you did see uh, Sean evolve. Cause it's the first time we've probably taken on, taken on that many losses during a season. Uh, even though uh, in years past, even last year, we, we had a three game losing skid. What I have always seen from Sean, not only Sean, but his staff is uh, anytime you're taking on water, right? There's, there's no certainty that you're going to be able to right patch up the boat or, 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 or bail the water out or, or figure out how to navigate the seas. But I know this uh, in each, whether it was this year, whether it was in years past, Sean and his staff have evolved in the moment. Uh, last year, I do remember, hey, we went to, hey, all of a sudden we had thir- you know, three tight ends on the field, one offensive lineman. Just small adjustments like that, steady the ship to figure out based on what's going on, how do you, you move forward. And, and a, a good example this season was, and I forget the 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 exact moment, it might have been the week before uh, our first Seattle game. And uh, I think John Wofford was going to start at, at, at QB. But I do I do know, going back to, I think, Sarah, what you said on, on okay, how, how we played offensively. Again, we've been a top five outfit in a lot of different categories. So I do remember there can be moments in seasons like this is when you're expecting to be a top five outfit, but you can't quite be a top five outfit. That can be frustrating. I do know, I remember a meeting Sean had with his staff said, hey, almost throw that out the window and go, okay, how do we have top five meetings during the week? How do we have top five drills on a Thursday at practice, right? How do we have a top five post-mortem meeting on a Monday? And really get back to focusing on some of those moments that uh, you can control, and 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 usually in those moments is when uh, a team evolves, uh, recalibrates, gets back uh, uh, on a path. And I do know, uh, even in those moments, we were definitely competitive uh, down the stretch in terms of you know playing quality football for for the situation we were in. And uh, going off of that last, you know, obviously injuries are a factor, but how do you assess the offensive line? You know, do you go through a drastic makeover or do you expect guys to be healthy? How do you repair that unit? That's a, that's an, uh, that would be an interesting one to try to assess this year because uh, uh, a, a lot of times you would have had a year like this and, and maybe some of the, the younger players, and when I say younger, a lot of times players that are on their rookie contracts would have gotten valuable uh, experience or – and, and even uh, some of those young men uh, were injured. So I, I do think there is a projection involved. There's going to be no certainty. It is, there is an element of, right, there are going to be a certain number of players that come back uh, that are on their rookie contracts, and, and there would be no reason to move on from those players. There may be uh, chances to add players from the draft, things like that. There could be from the outside and at that point you get people healthy uh you assess along the way and and collectively uh try to play better uh as a unit and sometimes that's right an individual change sometimes that's the collective getting wiser more experienced evolving all those things thank you les Stu. hey les kind of along the lines of what um Gilberto and Sarah were asking when how do you I guess view last season as a whole um, as it pertains to the way this roster is built do you feel like it was an outlier given the success and the run of good health from the previous five or six years or is it causing you to maybe reevaluate some things I would say this I I, I say each season is is our reality so uh, 2022 was it was our reality that was the story that we wrote, that is who we are. I think Bill Parcell says you are what your record uh, says you are. I've often said, hey, that's your scarlet letter, right? You you wear that record basically on the front of your, uh, right here, every time I go in Starbucks, right down the street, that's my record. And anyone that I see, even though I'm glad that uh, <clears throat> Gary Klein's got a nice uncle that's in there, so he's nice to me. He's not so uh, negative about the, the record inside joke between Gary and I, but point being with that too, is we've had, we were very successful uh, in terms of wins for the previous five years. 
this year, not so much. Uh, so how do you balance the cumulative? And, and that's kind of our job over the next uh, few months to figure out, right? Every year is different. Every year, there's an element of, of a, a remodel tweaks. Uh, we're very well aware that some of our core players, right, are in their primes and, and getting closer to the twilight of their primes. But that does not mean, right, when you're a player like that in your prime, that you're still not very, very productive and can be very successful in this league. So we'll have that balance of, of trying to navigate those waters, still be very, very competitive uh, in the micro, and then also realizing, you know, from a macro standpoint, there is going to be an element where we're probably going to have to, let's call it not press the gas as much, pay a little bit of the uh, debt that we've accumulated. Uh, I think all of y'all have kind of probably written about that at times. As you do some of the things that we've done, you're going to push some of that down the, the road. But we've been able to com be competitive paying some of that debt as well. And, and a lot of times I refer to debt as maybe some dead money on your salary cap. We've done that with dead money from Todd Gurley and, and Jared Goff. So there are ways, uh, not necessarily easy, but this league's not easy. And it's up to us to be uh, creative, innovative, and, and try to figure that out. Thank you. Greg. Hey, Les. Uh, building on what you just said there, you know, not pressing the gas, pay the debt that we've accumulated. I guess in a broad sense, you do feel like this team is not quite as deep across the board as it was for maybe the previous four, three or four years. Do you agree with that? Uh, that's a, that's a, I would you know, I, I could, if I were just going to answer you generally, yes. Now with that being said, I do think, I do think this year was slightly different than others in that. And I always look at that, right? How, how competent, you know, has our collective been? And we've been very competent as a collective unit over the last few years. And, and, and going back to 2021, I, and, and I use this example that was probably different this, than this year, and I'm not sure what percentage the different plays in the record, but uh, uh, in 21, down the stretch, when, you know, some very important games on the schedule, we lost Tyler Higby, and we had already lost Johnny Mutt during the season, and we were able to slide in a Kendall Blanton. Then he gets injured as well, and you're able to slide in a Bryson Hopkins. So I do think it probably, in terms of depth sometimes, it's right how often you have to use them, what situation are you putting them in. A lot of times in the past, we've been able maybe to slide some of our depth players into – uh, roles where they're, you know, where they're partnering with, let's call it nine, 10 other, let's call it starters per se, or, or, or players that were starters when the, when the season started. So, uh, so I, I think where we're at, there's one thing, right. When you get into, okay, depth, right. And that's okay. Who's the next man up. And I think situations can determine. And then there's the other side, probably the tougher side of the equation that I mentioned is, Okay, how are you also navigating, let's call it your non-depth? And those are the 11 players on offense, the 11 on defense, plus the four to five really contributing players on those sides of the ball. How are you navigating that in terms of, okay, you have a, let's call it a veteran core and making sure that you're able to slide in, let's call it a less veteran core seamlessly. So, uh, so I always get into looking at, starters first step and have, but I, I get what you're saying. So I could answer it. Yes, but I wanted to add a little bit of context to it. We appreciate the context. Thank you. Uh, does that change the way you think about the draft in any way fundamentally, or do you still see picks as capital that should be used in whatever way makes you better specifically these next couple of drafts? You know, uh, yes. I always think you, you, you always want to use them as capital in, in more ways than one, but going back to, I do think this year we're going to, we projecting ourselves to have uh, 10 picks once we have the comps, again, a, a lot of those picks are going to come on day three. And what we've been able to do because of that, let's call it, if, if our starting lineups were very competent as a collective, we've been able, right, to uh, use those later round picks. Uh, let's call it day three picks as, as, as relatively competent depth players that could come in, could partner uh, with those starters when necessary. Now, when you get into a situation where you're now relying more on uh, let's call it players on their rookie contracts to actually be key contributors, key starters. I do think having 
getting back to having some first rounders, getting back to having uh, second and third rounders <clears throat> will be uh, advantageous and doesn't necessarily mean uh, even when you have a first round pick. Now, depending on what it is, I use this example, uh, probably the year we had it maybe in, in 2019 where we were picking late in the first round and we were able to trade back with Atlanta and you turn that first rounder into maybe you know, multiple top 100 picks instead of just one first round pick. So that will be, uh, uh, I would say, we're looking forward to that uh, over the next uh, few years and do think that where we're at probably from a roster standpoint, that will be uh, healthy for us to add younger players, players on their rookie contracts that are going to become more cogs uh, over the, uh, let's call it, let's call it the, the chapter three per se. We're going to call this phase chapter three uh, of, of the Sean, Sean McVay era. Chapter three, thank you. Jordan? Hey, Les. Um, in the offseason last year, you guys um, did some contract maneuvering with several players who, part of your core, um, added Bobby Wagner to that core as well. Um, between the players of Matthew, Cooper, Aaron, Jalen, Bobby and Rob uh, Havenstein, how confident are you that you will be able to retain the entirety of this core heading into the next season? Yeah, that's what we got to figure out over the next uh, few weeks, few months uh, in that blueprint. I'm not going to get into the specifics of each of those players because, in, I mean, every year since we've been here, right, there's been moments where we've had to say goodbye uh, to key contributors, players that were very impactful and and help the Rams be successful, whether it's, you know, whether it's players moving on. And sometimes there's a positive of that, right? There have been players uh, that have been on their rookie contracts and they've moved on uh, probably to greener pastures in terms of uh, finances or financial stability. And, and that that's part of it too. And that there's been moments where based on the cap system and, and what we've done, we've had to be intentional about trading uh, different players and, and, and saying, uh, those goodbyes. That's the that's the toughest part of the business. And then th there's moments, right, where you get to welcome some players on board as well and vice versa. But going to stay, uh, you know, this is not the time and place to communicate either good or, or bad news per se. And then um, I know there's some, some mixed opinions about the idea of like what a window is. Um, but in terms of where you think this team and roster is at, uh, inclusive of getting healthy players back, you used the word remodel a few times in your session with us today. Do you think that's a better term to use than the word rebuild? Um, or where do you think this roster is at in terms of that? You know, I, I would think with the, with the way our roster is made up now, it would be tough to say a rebuild. It, we would almost have to somewhat uh, tear it down to rebuild. Uh, and by that, because we do have a lot of, right, really good players uh, in their prime on this roster. So it, a lot of times it's hard to say you're rebuilding with that type of roster. So you'd have to go through uh, some type of tear down to truly rebuild. But so that's why I use the word remodel and, and right. Who's here? Who do you add? How do you add those type things? And then also looking for, okay, what's the vision, not just for 2023, but 24, 25 and, and 26, which you're always trying to do. So, uh, the difference this year from the past is right. Usually when you, there's gotta be a, a level, a lot of times when you're successful and you're winning more games than losing there, there's an element. Okay. That, that's a window maybe to press the gas, to go uh, for, I would say in, in our case, right. Uh, do you ever say, okay, this is our, this is as good a time as ever to maybe try to be one of 32. And really knowing that if you, if you sat in a probability or stats class, the professor would probably tell you that's the most absurd thing they would ever hear. But based on the way this league set up and the game theory of it all, uh, that's the fun part of it. So uh, and then there's moments where you go, OK, wait a minute, maybe pressing the gas and going to be one of 32 is is not at this particular moment. But in those moments, right, I often say. Uh, going back to 2017, when you get back to going, okay, let's just take this thing one one game at a time, one day at a time, and wow, you 
you're competitive and you get to the tournament and, and you have a chance. And then um, last one for me, more of a big picture process question. Um, how has the pretty, uh, I think, historic uh, turnover rate of assistant coaches, how has that affected the way that you guys not just draft players, but the way that you develop them? Because, um, you know, certain coaches who have a, a heavy voice on certain players um, and then you draft, you know, you draft that player and then the next year, you know, maybe that player doesn't necessarily find a role. Yes, that's really good question. Uh, insightful. It does take work. It does take intentionality. Uh, obviously, when you when you're drafting players, there's an element of projection, projecting that player right on how his his skill set plus his subset of intangibles or I say how his God given mom dad talent plus the intangibles will project to some version of skill in the league. So not every player's ready made, not many of them are ready made, some are farther behind the other. So when you do bring on new coaches and you've never really worked with those coaches, it it does take intentionality to go, okay, wait a minute. In the past, we haven't bet on this type of player because he's not he's a little bit farther behind than we would like, but maybe a new coach is saying, wait a minute, I can actually do this, this, and this in what you said, the development process, and that player can, can get there. And because you hadn't worked together, you don't really have case studies of going, you know what, it, you know, we should listen or, or, or not listen, or how much do we weigh that assessment that does take time and, and continuity does help that. On, on the other side too, good point is, is when a, a new coach comes in, maybe changes a scheme, a different scheme, and a player that maybe fit another coach's scheme a little bit better is uh, not as highly thought of with a new coach based on not necessarily anything the player did other than, wow, his skill set fit some other coaches. So, so you try to blend all that together. And uh, yeah, so continuity, I think we've often said, usually there's continuity when there's success. So a lot of those, a lot of that success compounds to just more success because a lot of times when there's not success, there's not continuity, but we've, it's been interesting with us having success, but not being as continuity. I don't know if that's a word. Kevin will laugh at me for trying to make up a word, but we'll go with it. Thanks, Les. Gary. Hey, Gary. John, uh, a couple of weeks before the season ended, John had termed the season kind of a well, not kind of, he said it was a professional failure. Uh, and he clarified that to say that he didn't necessarily feel that way, but or, as an organization, you guys didn't live up to expectations. I'm just curious if you would term it the same way or how you see it. Uh, you know, I, I would, I do think Charles hard on himself, especially in, in that statement. But obviously, uh, this was not the standard, this was not our expectation. So it, it is our reality. And, and we didn't meet standards, uh, right, that we've set. And, and, and what probably everyone in the L.A. Rams ecosystem, uh, each of you, the media who, right, uh, are privileged enough to, to kind of cover this whole thing and, and our fans. So with that but being said, yes, Sean's probably a little hard I, uh, on that question. So we didn't meet our standards. We're uh, definitely aware of that. It is our reality, and and that's where we're standing today. And and I think the uh, there is an element of when you don't meet your reality is 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 you have to use uh, probably the sting of that uh, as fuel to to move into the future and try to uh, use some lessons from uh, all the from the successes that we've had and even the uh, unsuccesses that we've had and and try to evolve and uh, be better on the other side. And, you know, uh, you've been very candid about certain certain things that, that last year at the, at the rally, you know, you were you, you yelled to the crowd, F them picks, um, kind of uh, echoing a meme and also kind of maybe a philosophy that you guys uh, use to build a Super Bowl champion. You, you regret saying that or and how do you see it, you know, your philosophy moving forward? Uh, the, boy, that's a tough question. 
Super Bowl parade do I regret saying it. Uh, I, I can say this. I will admit that any time you probably say something like that, probably the cover of Madden has taught you you're going to you're going to eat those uh, words at some point in time. But I do think uh, in that particular situation, probably do not necessarily regret, uh, let's call it having fun with that, uh, you know, meme that kind of organically evolved over the, the last few years. But I do think I've said many a times here, uh, right, that we definitely, if, if we truly believed in effing them picks in that sense of the word, we just give them to our, right division opponents and, and not use them. So I do think we've tried to explain that's a fun way to look at it, uh, but we've definitely taken the draft uh, serious. We, uh, we think it's really the, the heartbeat, right, of the franchise. And then, and again, going back to some of the questions that we've, or discussion we've had on windows and, and pressing gases and going for one of 32 and, and, and using that maybe in a more innovative way, uh, than others so but yes Gary I did eat my words and I do remember I've never said this uh it was kind of a subliminal slip but I was I think I said basically shouldn't incriminate myself but I think I said something like we're gonna f these pick to to win more Super Bowls and I truly intended to say uh we f these picks to to win Los Angeles a Super Bowl championship. Uh, so I always knew I was going to eat those words at some point. But if there's ever a time to eat them, it was uh, in that situation. Finally, for me, um, in, in terms of your cornerstones, um, you know, you guys extended uh, Stafford and Donald and Cup last year. Uh, Jalen, you did not. Um, is Jalen a guy that you would th think to extend this off season or possibly trade? for uh, draft capital? You were in, I, I think I mentioned earlier to Jordan, going to keep the specifics. Now is not, you know, this isn't the discussion or time to communicate that, but, uh, you know, it, uh, all things are in play with us. The, it, it, I can say this, and when you when you said the word Jalen, we, we, we had a lot of adversity this year in terms of, let's call it injuries to some of those players you mentioned, but boy, was it awesome to, to see Jalen play the way he did for 17 games pretty sure he played all 17 uh I know he played most of them and and and, and in particular you could watch us really playing games on a Sunday and not necessarily in the playoff hunt maybe even mathematically eliminated you have a probably one of the better if not the best corners in the NFL not just playing outside inside but boy inserting uh on the run game and some short yardage situations in the goal line. Take our, take our week 17 loss to Seattle. We're probably, we're probably not in overtime. Uh, take all the really good quality calls that were made during that game. Uh, we're probably not in, uh, no one laughed at that. Uh, uh, we're probably not in overtime if Jaden doesn't make that tackle on Kenneth Walker down there in the red zone. And, that's what I remember. That's that's the, when you say Jalen. That's what I'm thinking about right now with him. What a competitor! Holy cow! Thank you, Maria. Hey, Les. When you talk about bringing in new candidates for coaches, is there something specific that you can sort of feel when you meet them if they might be a good fit? Not knowing if they're going to fit all the players because the players could change. But is there a certain feel or philosophy that you feel when you speak to them that, you know what, this is a good fit for our team. I, I, in, in total transparency, uh, Sean's going to handle 90 to 95% of that, you know, the lifting of, of hiring those coaches and he will, you know, he will spend time in there and I do know, and, I, and I'll get to come in and, and, and say hello and things like that. And every now and then I, I listen and sit in. Uh, but I, I know, I know what Sean really, definitely is looking forward to right someone that's going to be highly skilled uh probably from a tactical standpoint from a developmental standpoint and also uh right just have the intangibles to be a really good teammate within our collaborative and collective outfit unless was there ever a thought in your mind that sean may not come back you know what there the, the answer would be yes i definitely think uh you know, he was definitely thinking serious about maybe 
uh, taken a moment to take a breath. Uh, so I think we were prepared for that, but because the because of most of our discussions over the last few years, that never came to fruition. It, it was more, we were, we were talking conceptually, right, about how to uh, evolve uh, our, let's call it daily, monthly, annual rhythms to uh, make this a more sustainable uh, uh, outfit. Thank you. Eric? Hey, Les, just to build on that, um, what was your reaction when he when he told you that he was going to come back? Uh, you, I, I think that I would go uh, relief in that, uh, and maybe more relief and excitement, but some version of both. Uh, because what what Sean has shown, what Sean has proven, what everyone else who's probably on a search right now is looking for and hoping for is someone right, that is shown that uh, he can engineer a process, right, from A to Z that leads to the uh, helic results on a Sunday afternoon and, and the math on that scoreboard works out in your favor, whether it's Thursday, Thursday night, sometimes Saturdays, Sunday, Sunday night, sometimes Monday nights. And uh, that's, a, that's a very, very uh, difficult projection to uh, search for. So having uh, someone who's shown the ability uh, to engineer the process, you know, to go from A to Z and have success, boy, relief, excitement for the future. And then one more, you talked about remodel. How much does having these young guys play meaningful snaps during the regular season help accelerate what you wanna do uh, this off season? That, uh, that would probably be one of the roses of, of the thorns, the many thorns of this year uh, is that players on their rookie contracts or some that have come, you know, different, but whatever the case actually uh, uh, garners experience. And within that experience, you, you have a chance to, to evaluate and determine, okay, is there a role for that particular player moving forward uh, and that's the and that's been one of probably the I would say the the roses of the successes of the last five years is we've had a lot of key players that played a lot of snaps and were healthy for a lot of years and, and there were times where uh, I mean you take the case of Joe Noteboom right we, we drafted him and and really he he never got a chance to let's call it start to become a key starter until after his rookie contract expired now he was a player that was able to a uh, good example of filling in with that very very competent collective and that competent collective still being to go on and accomplish uh good and even great things but that's been one of the the thorns of uh, probably the Let's call it the success we've had in terms of durability is we've had some uh, players that were, uh, I call it rookie classes, that didn't get a chance to play a lot other than, uh, let's call it, uh, roles when uh, usually there was an emergency situation. Does that change your approach as a franchise, being forced to play those guys instead of like Joe, where you, you didn't have to play because the guy in front of him was so good? You didn't have to find a place for them. Uh, yeah, I think that I think it probably depends on the situation you're in. There, there will be moments where, right, you're going to onboard a player. Uh, let's call it, and, and there will be moments where you're going to onboard a rookie. And for all intents and per, all intenses and purposes, he's going to end up starting, right? If if he does his part, just based on maybe there's a a, a hole in the roster, uh, and then there there will be times where. And we've been very fortunate over the last uh, uh, five seasons in particular where we've drafted a lot of players and they weren't, we weren't necessarily expecting them to start because the, the starters who had been successful were, return, were returning. Or maybe we added a, a player uh, via trade, right? Another veteran uh, to come right in via trade. So uh, I, think, I think we're probably heading to the uh, point here in the in the near future starting 
probably in the 23 season in the 24 and 25, where again, like our veteran core, uh, uh, their timeline is going to come to an end and, and we're going to uh, have to rely on some players in their rookie contracts to be key cogs. All right, wrap up with you, Dennis. Dennis is on mute. You're on mute, Dennis. That one heck of a question, Dennis. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. How are you today? Uh, good. good. Older. Good. Got older today. No. Oh. <laughs> um, I me guess that's really bad. <laughs> I think there's, there's roses and thorns to that in a philosophical nature. Um, in not meeting your standards, how much is attributed to injuries as opposed to talent? Uh, you know what? I think it. I think injuries are uh, are variable. Don't know what percentage. Uh, obviously, not having the roster ready to compete uh, is definitely a percentage. Not sure we're gonna totally I call it a reverse, reverse engineer that try to figure that out because we couldn't necessarily run that model to see hey which was which but uh, we know that those two uh, variables along with other variables uh, played a role in us not meeting our standards and, and, and we've got to go back to the drawing board learn some lessons evolve uh, uh, apply those lessons things like that and, and sometimes I, I can say this and, and not necessarily as in the excuse but often I say this too is at the end of the day uh always give our opponent and our enemies credit as well in that the NFL doesn't revolve around us and uh, on more Sundays than not this year uh our opponents our enemies were just better than us so uh sometimes it's not just us uh let's call it not being up to par but it's those guys being better than us on that particular uh, Sunday. 